Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Radiation Research Society's April webinar. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Ala Shapiro presenting Chernobyl 35 years later. My name is Cassandra Carlson, and I will be hosting the webinar on the back end. This webinar is approximately 45 minutes, followed by a 15 minute Q&A session. Moderating today is Dr. Bert Maidment. Dr. Maidman is currently an executive consultant for BW Maidman LLC, and provides consulting services and advice in the biomedical and biotechnology research and product development space to clients in academia and industry. He received his PhD in experimental pathology and masters from the State University of New York at Buffalo and his bachelor's in biology from Dickinson College. Previously, Dr. Maidman was an associate director for the Radiation Nuclear Countermeasures Program, Division of Allergy, Immunology and Transplantation, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, National Institutes of Health. He was also Vice President for Corporate Business Development at Midwest Research Institute, Vice President for Operations and Marketing with LIM Laboratories, Co-Founder and Vice President for Product Development of NY Gene Corporation and served numerous board positions. With that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Bert Maidman to introduce Dr. Ala Shapiro. Well, thank you, Cassandra, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending upon where you are today. Today is uh, the 23rd of April, 2021, uh, three days before the 35th anniversary of Chernobyl, widely known as the world's worst nuclear accident in history, and the Soviets' deceitful and inept attempts to respond to the physical and human devastation in the aftermath. Untold numbers of lives were affected by that disastrous incident. The level of response unpreparedness to the physical destruction, radiation dispersal and containment, and the medical and psychological needs of the affected population was uncovered. Today, we have Dr. Paula Shapiro, physician, scientist, inventor, author, colleague, friend, and grandmother. And she will uh, continue telling her personal story in this part two, long-term health effects of a Chernobyl accident of the doctor on-call presentations. We thank the Radiation Research Society for supporting the pres presentation series, and especially Ala for her strength, persistence, faithful focus in writing about her incredible journey. I introduce Dr. Ala Shapiro. Thank you so much, Bert, for your wonderful and generous introduction. I would also like to thank the organizers of Radiation Research Society for inviting me to speak today. Also, my appreciation to Cassandra Carlson, who is an amazing technical support for me. And I would like also to thank Beth Wong, who helped me with the slide design that I hope you will like as much as I do. Traditionally, we take whole message is delivered at the end of the presentation. I will break this tradition just for today and convey my message, my take home message for you at the beginning. We remember the past to protect our future. The road from crisis to hope is a hard one. However, if we support each other on this journey, we could protect generations to come from the future disaster. I will pause for a few seconds since this slide does not require any comments, and I would just encourage you to read the message on the left side of the slide, which tells us the whole story. And just to add to this, that we will not forget everyone, no one who participated and then subsequently suffered was a victim of Chernobyl. Faces of these children should not be forgotten. 
Chernobyl Children International Project was founded in 1991 by Adi Roche, who is a humanitarian activist and campaigner for nuclear disarmament. I would like to share few photographs on the of the monuments that were built across the Ukraine to honor people who died trying to save the world. As you might remember, the first 30 kilometer inclusion zone was, was the area from where all people were evacuated and the radius was 30 kilometer and evacuation started late, 36 hours after the explosion and then the whole area was placed under military control. However, over time, scientists and government representatives realized that the borders of the exclusion zone should be expanded to cover a larger area of contamination. And one of the most contaminated village in Ukraine was Poliski. And the evacuation of this village did not happen until 1993. So all the people from Poliske was evacuated in 1993. And this is a monument that remained there. It was erected before the evacuation. And it was a bell hanging in the middle. However, the bell was stolen as the metal would have a significant scrap value. With this slide, I would like uh, you to read also the caption under the picture. And I put it this slide just to clarify one of the inaccuracies surrounding the accident. And this was the notion that this helicopter, that one of the helicopters was fallen in the middle of the reactor crater because of the high radiation and blast and fires, but this is not true for two reasons. You see the date, it was in October, and we know that the blaze lasted, the fire lasted for 10 days and then stopped. So the burning reactor was not the reason that this helicopter and all the crew died. It just, the cable was turned around the rotor and that's what happened. This monument is in Kyiv and it dedicated to workers, to the workers who died in cleanup efforts in 1986. Many deaths could have been avoided. Dangerous unpreparedness of the government healthcare providers and population to respond to nuclear disaster, failures of infrastructure, all contributed to excessive morbidity and mortality happened after the disaster. And although 35 years have passed since the accident, the health consequences of Chernobyl continued to be widely discussed in the medical literature the accumulation of knowledge about the long-term health effects of the accident is an ongoing process. And this is another message that please remember, there are lots and lots of publications in credible journals and books, but there are lots of conflicting data, lots of even confusing data. And that's why it's an ongoing process to really get the good and true assessment of long-term effects. Different disasters have many things in common and wounds from every crisis present in both physical and mental form. In particular, the psychosocial impact of disasters and emergencies has been well documented. This report was published by WHO in 2005. Few years ago, it was revisited and the WHO 
confirmed this conclusion that the largest public effect disaster was unleashed in the face of psychological problems. Therefore, I would like to start with the psychological impact on Chernobyl disaster on affected population. And I will refer to affected population as a broad group of adults who were cleanup workers, general population, people who were evacuated from the area and children who also were evacuated from this 30 kilometer zone. So this whole group is encompassed uh, the affected population group. The important distinction that we make between cleanup workers who developed psychological effects and general populations, the risk factors are different. For cleanup workers, the main risk factor was the severity of exposure the timing, the dose, duration. For general population, it's interesting finding, this was confirmed by many studies. The major risk factor was perceived exposure to harmful levels of radiation. I chose this famous painting, Scream, by Edward Monk as a timeless expression of human fear. Besides here, the affected population experienced stress-related anxiety and depression. Evacuation was one of the devastating events after Chernobyl. An official evacuation of children from Kiev did not start until late June. However, many people started moving their children away from Kyiv at the beginning of May. The hunt for either train tickets or airplane tickets was really unsuccessful. Tickets were unavailable even at the black markets. It took me five days to buy a ticket for my three-year-old daughter and her grandmother to send them to the clean area. Thank you. And we'll have just a blank screen and I want to say a few words about anxiety, more details. People who were evacuated from the contaminated areas were twice the anxiety levels in those people were twice as high compared to non-exposed population. Adult and children who were relocated more likely have multiple unexplained physical symptoms such as headaches, abdominal pain, and muscle pain. To some extent, these symptoms were driven by the belief of these people that their health was affected by radiation. And this disorder fall under a well-known term such as somatization. To ascertain the quantity of the evidence of severe mental impact, a questionnaire was presented to people in some of the villages in Belarus. And Belarus was highly, highly affected by radiation. So the study reveals that one third of the participants thought about Chernobyl almost every day, and this is 30 years after, and half of the participants still thought that radiation is responsible not only for their mental, but also for their physical symptoms. Besides anxiety and depression, the affected population experience other symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, such as an increased cases of suicide and increased alcohol and drug consumption. For some unknown reasons, the suicide level were higher in Lithuanian and Estonian cleanup workers compared to populations from other area. Also, the risk of social isolation is a common feature 
for many disasters. And we are well aware and many of us has experienced this during pandemic, how loneliness affects those at risk, especially elderly people. With regard to effects of low levels of radiation of brain development in children, there are also conflicting data. Some studies show that IQ in children whose mothers were subjected to radiation during the pregnancy have low IQ. However, other studies do not confirm these findings. So what did we learn from Chernobyl in terms of psychological effect? This is a just summary for that that mental health problems increase after disaster and manifest years after the event. That is why it is important to provide access to mental health services in disaster affected areas on a long-term basis. Enhancing social support, increasing opportunities for social interaction and following strategies that different population, different group of populations require different approach. And this is the life-saving approach if we able to make this distinction, what is better for elderly people, was better for young people, people who lost their jobs and relocated and lost their houses and friends. Also physical health monitoring after the accident is very important. Moreover, this is not my opinion. This is of course what I got from the current literature. The value of training non-psychiatrist physicians in recognizing and treating common mental health problems like depression is beneficial. So before I go to the long-term effects, I will like to summarize the acute effects of radiation, mainly acute radiation syndrome in survivors. Again, it is very important to distinguish the occurrence of acute radiation syndrome and its outcome in different groups, such as first responders, cleanup workers and general population. So this is a short slide, but since during part one, I did not address any science, just personal stories, I would like to summarize this. And it's pretty fascinating finding. Acute radiation syndrome was diagnosed, again, some credible sources say in 115, first responders, the other would say 128. And this is not a big difference compared with the first fresh data after Chernobyl that said 234 patients acquired acute radiation syndrome. And then the all this were reassessed. So this is a number, let's say 115 to 128. Clean up operation workers, and another term for them, liquidators, the same, did not develop acute radiation syndrome. Also, ARS did not occur in anyone in general population exposed to radiation after the Chernobyl disaster. Now I will describe late health effects of radiation. This will involve malignant and non-malignant diseases, and you'll see it on that slide. So I will quickly go over in my subsequent slides on this, the most occurred malignancies as well as non-malignant such as cardiovascular and cataracts. An important finding came with the increased risk in cataracts in a screen cohort of Ukrainian cleanup workers. The most critical issue when considering the effects of radiation on the health of children was the increase of thyroid cancer. And 
please read of the slides so I can make other comments than you see there. I will give you a few seconds without distractions. So data on potassium iodide, if given before or in the first three to five hours after exposure, potassium iodide will protect the thyroid gland from absorbing radiation, thus significantly decreasing the risk of thyroid cancer. However, the information about this was not communicated neither to medical first responders nor to the general public. And we all learn about potassium iodide through the rumors. Several days after the disaster, potassium iodide appeared on the shelves of the pharmacies and horrified parents, including myself, were buying it to give to children. And we didn't know the doses, we did not know the regimen. So one day I was called to the emergency room of the hospital where I work and ambulances were bringing children suffering from gastric bleeding. Their parents lacking knowledge of proper dosing and frequency had given their kids too much of this protector. Also parents were also unaware that their efforts were too late. The children had been exposed to the radiation 10 days ago. One of the Chernobyl legacy points, in the early days after the nuclear accident, the primary concern should be efforts to prevent the exposure in children to radioactive iodine that they could get through inhalation and ingestion because radioactive iodide preferentially accumulates in the thyroid. With regard to long-term isotopes that the most harmful is strontium cesium 137 with a half-life of uh, 30 years. In assessing the incidence of any Chernobyl related disease of concern. In this case is thyroid cancer. We should remember that the increased incidence cases of thyroid cancer in Ukraine, Belarus and part of Russia to some extent may also be a reflection of increased medical monitoring and diagnosis in the wake of the disaster. This slide showed the most affected region in former Soviet Union. And you can see, you probably heard, maybe somebody, someone lived in those areas even or visited. So these are the areas and you see Kiev right in the middle of that. So in the next few slides, I will address regional and gender differences in cancer rate. So Kiev, again, I don't want to read all the bullets, but what I would like to emphasize that incidence rate of cancer were consistently higher in men than in women, except for thyroid cancer, which was higher in women. I would like to say a few words about last bullet, urinary bladder cancer. It was lots of scientific work was and clinical work was done around this type of cancer. And increased rate of urinary bladder cancer was noticed in men with benign prostatic hypoplasia. And it got a I think very proper explanation that men who suffer from benign prostatic hyperplasia have urinary retention. Urine contains 
at that time and all these years, the highly increased levels of cesium-137. And 137, cesium, when it was deposited uh, for a long time in the urinary bladder, was irritation of urothelium and subsequently neoplastic lesions of urinary bladder. The other characteristic of cancer, it showed high, extremely high lethality, particularly among people under age of 65 years. And again, there is not much explanation why the lethality from similar cancer in different countries would be maybe lower. But what I found also interesting that in many countries, variations exist in the quality of healthcare, access to healthcare and its quality in rural compared to urban areas. Ukraine has the most dramatic rural urban differences, not only compared to former Soviet Republic, but compared to other countries. This might explain this high level of lethality. Most European regions were exposed to radiation fallout in a random fashion because of a combination of winds and precipitations during in the days following disaster. Each country, including Ukraine, Belarus, other European countries, Greece, Romania, had this also patchy distribution of radionuclide. Some recent data from Finnish study showed a significant increase in colon cancer among females. These unexplained findings of higher incidence of certain can cancers in women compared to men echoes finding that were brought up by a biologist, Mary Olson, who is a founder of Gender Plus Radiation Impact Project. The goal of this innovative project, I'm citing her, or points, uh, highlights of the project, is to keep our grandchildren from experiencing harm from radiation. Referencing some more points of the project, such as today, we have better choices for preventing unintended exposure to radiation for everyone, but especially for little girls who are most impacted. Again, this is only pertains to certain cancers, as I want to emphasize again that urinary bladder cancer and obviously prostate cancer more prominent in men, same as lung cancer, esophageal cancer, but some other can cancers are more frequently in women. Through Mary Olson's work as a staff biologist and policy analyst at Nuclear Information and Resource Services, she spent decades working for greater health and greater protection for people in communities impacting by radiation. Now, one of the other cancers, non-solid cancer, is leukemia. So leukemia cases is mainly related to strontium-90 deposition. And the reason the strontium-90 behaves like calcium in the human body and tends to deposit in bone and blood forming tissue such as bone marrow. Because of that, strontium often refer to as a bone seeker and exposure to this radionuclide will increase the risk for several diseases, including bone cancer, cancer of the soft tissue that near the bone and leukemia. Again, what is not 
being explained until now, the incidence of the bone cancer is not high. Well, risk probably high because we know this from bone seeker such as strontium, but it's really did not go up. For exposure to this isotope, we will look back and bring up the link between leukemia and radiation exposure after the after Hiroshima. There, the leukemia cases went up. Studies regarding the leukemia after Chernobyl, in my opinion, after I compare, try to compare as many as I can, the studies are not inclusive and data from different studies are even confusing at times. So summaries of many studies will just say, we need to confirm the link between childhood leukemia and Chernobyl accident. Cases of leukemia, I've seen few from children who were evacuated from contaminated area one girl was from this police cave village that you might remember was evacuated only in 1993. She developed leukemia two years after she was subjected to radiation and was waiting outside for eight hours or 10 hours until the buses will arrive to evacuate the children. A few words on risk factors for cardiovascular diseases that show dramatic increase in population and all pretty much known risk factors. The one tells us about the more significant the exposure, the longer the exposure, and the risk factors go up. But we should not forget that there were and still are lots of concerns of adequacy of the dosimetry. I mentioned before that dosimeters were confiscated or dosimeters were recalibrated. So they just gave the reading that the government wanted, not the real reading. So these risk factors is also needs to be taken with remembering this. In collaboration with the Ukrainian National Research Institute for Radiation Medicine and the Ukrainian and the US uh, NCI, the project was initiated and it had a name, TRIO project, the, the shortest name. And also I'll give you a chance to read of the slides. This is an ongoing study since the first time I saw the results uh, published in scientific magazine last night. It was really too late to read the whole study. Maybe this will be good for part three of the webinar, but I just was able to pick the highlights of the study. So the new study highlights the importance of a particular kind of DNA damage that involves breaks in both DNA strands in the thyroid tumors. And this is just one part of the study is exploring thyroid tumor. The association between DNA double strand breaks and radiation exposure was stronger for children exposed at younger age. I will have a link to this study so you can get all the detail on that. We are now in Chernobyl of 2020, which is just one year ago. And this happened on Sunday, April 5th, 2020. A friend of mine living in the US sent me a text message, which started with the words, new story about fire near Chernobyl. And I searched for reliable information online and I found out that the blaze started two days before the information became available on April 3rd, right on the site of the Chernobyl nuclear power station, and then fire spread to nearby forest. The fires are not 
infrequent in that area due to unusually dry weather, especially in 2020. But police also reported that they had identified and accused a 27 old local resident who deliberately set fire to grass in the region. Ukrainian authorities, exactly what happened 35 years ago, have attempted to play down fears that radiation could spread to the capital, Kyiv, 62 miles from Pripyat. And I called my friends who lived in Kyiv and asked them if they know anything what's happening in the neighborhood. And they said that no, they didn't. So I became, as 35 years ago, Voice of America became a source of information for me. Last year, my voice from America came to alert my friends what happened there. And in the American press, the, although Ukrainian would say there is nothing dangerous, fire is not a big deal, in the US literature, I found even the number of how many firefighters, and it was 400 firefighters who were sent to fight this blaze. So the fires reach so-called red forest, which is the most contaminated area. And one of the famous tourist attraction, which called Emerald Camp, has been burned to the ground. Luckily, there were no tourists there at that time. So again, disinformation is once again being sent from the top to the bottom of the political ladder. And we all know now that history already presented to us that impact of lies on everyone working in response to the disaster are deadly. And if public officials fail to communicate with citizens what's going on inside the country during the disaster, then it's impossible to reach help from the outside. Well, having said all that, Life still, at least wildlife, still goes on at Chernobyl and its vicinity. But the forest, which was green at some point, became red, yellow or red, and now it's even official name, red forest. And this is because there were many pines in that forest and their needles were quickly absorbed all the radiation. And that's why this forest became red in half an hour after what happened. In terms of animal population, it's really grown very much lately. And in this regard, it's ironic that the presence of humans and their waste products cause more discomfort to animals than creation. So animals adapted to this much better. And it manifestation all these wild animals that could be found there, animals and birds. Thank you. And I will just say some more insights 35 years later. Thanks to hard lessons learned from Chernobyl, we now have much better approaches for protecting human health and safety in the nuclear arena. This was achieved through the work of Ukrainian and scientists all over the world and collaboration among a global scientific community. This is very, very important to keep these ties. Other lessons that we learned that government should keep citizens informed of dangers related to catastrophic event, whether radiation exposure or virus, so the protective measures can be taken. 
approach that was popular during the Chernobyl, less knowledge, more silence, and less panic, regrettably caused the unnecessary loss of lives of a significant number of people. Downplaying the disaster, taking measures such as confiscating or recalibrating dosimeters only propel the tragedy. And politicians, as in that case, should not be editing the signs to suit their political needs. We also learned that the importance of proper communication during the disaster is very important. Who contact, how to contact, and how to verify and confirm the information. Everything needs to be in action. And finally, government must develop a national strategy for dealing with catastrophes. They must ensure good coordination among government agencies as they prepare without denial of science and without delay for the next disaster. Thank you. We have a few questions. First one is from the Ukraine, and they want to ask if there are any studies done on the environment of Chernobyl and the health status of the people who refused to leave their homes after the disaster and still live in nearby areas? And if so, could you provide any published works? Yes, such data exist. And the area in Ch Chernobyl is a officially ghost town. Nobody lives there. I saw the pictures, I didn't go there myself to revisit, but everything looks like the end of the world. It's probably what it looks like. And the uh, environment there, it won't be safe for, for generations. The radionuclide with a long half-life were deposited in soil and then it just turned in natural cycle of how the isotope will go through the half-life and then again, and the life half-life, for example, 30 years, then it will take a long time for this isotope to disappear. I know that mushrooms and berries still have high levels of radionuclide, but some people try to ignore the fact and there are lots of markets where you can buy outside Chernobyl, where you can buy mushrooms, jams, vegetables from there. There are people and they call the name for them, I know the Russian name, people who went back and they didn't want to leave. But it were people mainly who were old people. Again, their families, younger generation, their children and um, grandchildren, they didn't want to stay there. So they all abandoned the city. However, first I read a long time ago that there were 100 people who came back and continue their life. And I didn't hear about, I am not aware of any really bad health outcomes. And one of the explanations were that the people were old, so they would die. And that what happened if they were 70 years old, 35 years ago, or even 60, then most likely they died from some natural causes not related to radiation. Thank you, Ala. And we have another question. Do you think it would be reasonable to do adequate public education prior to an event sufficient to mitigate any psychosomatic effects of radiophobia 
as a means to address this risk? Yes, thank you. It's a great question. And I have the same question. However, I thought about this for many years, you know, teaching students at Georgetown University, for example, and giving some lectures at AFRI, people must know before the disaster. Doctors need to have better training to recognize what is happening. If somebody was affected by radiation, have it somewhere on the back of their mind. And if time comes that this thought should be you know, prevailing and move it, how to achieve it? So my, my answer is absolutely yes, but how to achieve it? Should we start with the medical school and have some classes that would teach? Should we have maybe some commercials on the big TV? Oh, not big, some TV channels that people could hear about it and be aware. So awareness is one of the the most important. We have a follow-up question from the Ukraine. What would be an optimal treatment plan to help people with PTSD after the disaster like this? Proper treatment for PTSD? Well, obviously it depends on how pronounced is PTSD. The best approach is to talk to people before the occurrence of any symptoms. After symptoms occur, it depends. If it's depression, then I don't know if anything besides medication would help. If it's anxiety, I am also, well, taking into account that I'm not as a psychiatrist, but I have big interest in PTSD. So the main recommendation to have people prepare to the event that might happen. And the best thing before the disaster happened, it should be maybe some application on telephone that people could call and ask the question and there is 24 hours help. If someone is experiencing symptoms of PTSD, any of the symptoms, and there are a variety of them, it's best not to talk to your peer who might be experiencing the same symptom. And if you share with your friend or neighbor that you're feeling such and such, and your neighbor will say, oh, you know, I it's normal because I feel the same way. And this is the the biggest mistake, not to bring up these concerning symptoms to the level that help is available. In what way would hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism alter effects of iodine-131? And do people with these conditions have higher chances of getting cancer? This has been studied, and one of the answers why thyroid cancer is so high in Ukraine and Belarus, the, the children there, sure. most of them, iodine deficient. And this factor is one of the main factors, iodine deficiency, that contribute to increase of thyroid cancer. Next question, Dr. Shapiro, thank you for your amazing talk. Education is, of course, essential, but how to educate the general population without spreading fear of nuclear power? Well, how to educate general population without spreading power, just tell them the truth that they don't have to be afraid of existing of nuclear power stations. We have 99 nuclear power stations in the 33 states in the United States. So they are there, but it doesn't mean that any of them will have the outcome of Chernobyl. So 
I think if you tell people that the personnel at the stations are well prepared, they know what they're doing, they have protocol, they have guidance that every word has meaning there. I know that how to administer potassium iodine in, in every single guidance in the US, it's everywhere. So people should not be panic that this will happen. It's absolutely not necessary. I think the, the main approach will be to be prepared and to inform the population that it's not an inevitable, but they need to be aware. They need to trust government. They need to trust media. But for that, we all need to trust these sources and media can do a lot if they have valuable and correct information. Changing the answers from media every hour to provide the different and opposite information, it's not helpful. I think there should be some lag period until media will give us some messages. They should be verified before the population will hear them. What is the continuing international support to the residents and medical staff in that region? Your slide acknowledged Irish volunteers? Yeah, exactly. This is an amazing movement and amazing charity. I know that besides of taking care of children of Chernobyl, this is how the project called the title, there were hundreds of children who were adopted by Irish families. So they have new life, they have parents, they live in a wonderful country, they have all the possibilities. And this was this is what this project, Chernobyl Children International, is doing. And I was honored to work in Ireland at Camp Children of Chernobyl in 1997 as a pediatric hematologist, oncologist, and a translator. Children from Ukraine and Belarus who were diagnosed with leukemias and lymphomas, but they were in remission, they came to this camp called Baronstone Camp. And they spent three weeks there. Then they were sent back home. No parents, uh, just uh, they, they were accompanied by representative from their country, countries. Besides of that adoption of children and giving them new life, also this project until now has big influence in Ukraine and Belarus. Doctors from all over the world go to, especially I aware of this, that was going on in Ukraine and Adi Roche uh, enlightened me on that. There were lots of children in Ukraine who were dying of cardiovascular diseases, not related to Chernobyl, either congenital or some acquired condition. And there were no medications, there were no places to treat the children, to perform surgeries. So physicians from all over the world were sent to Kiev and they're still there despite of coronavirus pandemic. And those brave surgeons performed surgery on children. Mainly I, I've heard about cardiovascular surgeries and they saved life of many children. And this is a charity as I mentioned in at the beginning. So this is an absolutely amazing what 
international community is doing for these children. Out of all the cases that you have seen due to this event, what was the most devastating for you personally, making you want to talk about this topic, to not forget about what has happened? Oh, thank you. I guess, uh, the, well, there were not, there were more than one cases that prompted me to tell people about my experience and experience of my colleagues. But what was really probably the most hurtful when I was deployed with three other physicians in one of the most contaminated areas in Ukraine. And uh, we were not allowed to tell the population that the levels of radiation are high there. We were not allowed to tell them don't eat food, although even if we did, then there was no way that they will get food from somewhere else. So this was very, very hard for us. And sometimes we had to break our silence. Once I was passing through the kitchen at one of the hospitals and kitchen was adjacent to the lab. So I also had to go through the lab and I saw autoclaves in the lab that were designed to disinfect surgical instruments. And I saw mushrooms that were hanging in the autoclave that some of the nurses or doctors collected mushrooms, highly irradiated, one of the most contaminated product about everything, all the other food that was growing there. And they decided to hang the mushrooms to dry them just to have food for winter. So when I saw that, I, I couldn't be silent. And I told the nurse, don't do this because this is a really bad, and I called it Chernobyl diet. And I explained at that time to them. So this was, I will never forget that. Do you think with all the reactors worldwide getting older and older, the probability of another accident happening increases despite continuous maintenance? I think that with regard to reactors and what's going on at the power stations, it should not be a big risk. And the reason that the first the designs of the current modern stations are the design is very different. Chernobyl was a fall design and the personnel was also not aware of many things. And I don't think that risk dramatically increased with the existence of the nuclear power stations if everything is managed there correctly. What more risk is terrorist nuclear attack, nuclear bomb detonation. This is what concerns me the most, not nuclear stations. This is bringing the presentation to a close. And I personally want to thank you, Ala, for your passion, your persistence, and your insights in this horrible, devastating incident. And hopefully, as we reconcile all of this, we can, as a world, become much more educated and not fearful of, of radiation for nuclear power, but also to increase our abilities to respond in a health mode to help people who have been exposed to radiation, whether it be a medical effect or a psychological effect. Appreciate all of your work in that area. Thank you so much, Bert. Your conclusion is absolutely capturing everything, and I have nothing to add. You said all it. 
Thank you. And thank you all for listening. And I'm very happy to be here and to continue my work. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.